Amen. So Genesis 21, this is uh, um, not really, it's not really a super eventful chapter. Um, there's some, some events that go on in here, and of course, and there's, uh, we're going to talk about, really, this is the chapter where all the blessings of the Lord that, that He has promised Abraham finally come to fruition. And at the end of this chapter, um, uh, basically what, what we're going to see is it, it almost could end right here, and it would be the happy ending to the story. Life is good. All things have been resolved. You know, in them television shows, by the end of the show, everything's got to be resolved. It's got to be back to normal. Everything's got to be good, no matter what's going on. And you see this at the end of this chapter. Um, it looks like Abraham is just finally going to be able to relax and enjoy the blessings that God has promised him. Everything is just turned up roses for him. Um, and what it is, is a bridge, really. Um, we're going to see that the blessing, uh, he's going to have Isaac in this in this chapter. And so that blessing, that promise is going to be fulfilled. And then the, the threat for the, the inheritance of Isaac, Ishmael, who's still in the family, still living with the family, is going to be removed. Uh, and then he's going to have make a covenant with uh, Abimelech, the same Abimelech that we saw in the last chapter. And he's going to have his run of the land. And he's going to have you know plenty of water and plenty of a covenant with the king of the land that he can have whatever he wants and all those kind of things. And so he's going to have the fulfillment of the blessings. He's going to have the son that he was promised. He's going to have the threat of the son's inheritance removed. Uh, we're going to look at that as we go through it. And he's going to have just peace and blessing in the land. And so really this whole chapter is just about how wonderful things are now that the blessings have come to pass. But in reality, we know that Abraham is still in the school of faith. And so what this chapter does is it really just sets the stage because what's going to happen, and I'm giving you kind of a preview because this chapter goes with the next, is that you're going to see blessing after blessing after blessing, promise fulfilled, the sun comes, the threat is removed, he has peace in the land, everything is just wonderful. At the end of this chapter, you could say, and they lived happily ever after. And it's just the greatest, wonderful blessing that he's received, and then and right in the beginning of chapter 22, God says, you know that son I just gave you that I promised 25 years ago? I want you to go kill him. Uh, he's going to bring him to a time of testing. Abraham's still in the school of faith. So as we look at chapter 21, let's go, um, let's go verse by verse. And we're just going to walk through these. But I wanted to give you the, kind of the overarching picture of what we're seeing. Uh, it's hard for us, if we just take 21 by itself, to kind of see how it fits into the story uh, because of, of all the things that have gone on before and what comes after. Uh, so to give you that picture, I wanted to make sure you knew that this is really just a transition transitional chapter to show everything is 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 fulfilled everything is being done and it is wonderful and beautiful and great and then he's going to put Abraham to the test in the next chapter so it says in the very first verse first two verses of this chapter it said the Lord visited Sarah as he had said and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised and Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him so the son of promise that he was given the promise he was given 25 years ago when he came to the promised land is finally a reality it says the Lord visited Sarah. That's the promise that he made back in chapter 18 before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. Remember, the Lord said, I will visit you within a year's time and you will have a son. And she laughed. Uh, well, he, it's the same language. The Lord visited Sarah just as he had said. And she conceives and she bears a son at 90 years old. Sarah bear, uh, bears a son. Now notice the emphasis of these two verses. What's the emphasis on? Do you see it? It's repeated three times times in three different ways. You see it? God's promise that he has done. It says the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. 
And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in, her, in his old age at the time, at the time of which God had spoken to him. So the emphasis is on God's word, God's promise. The emphasis is on God did what he said he was going to do. Just as he said, just as he promised, just as he had spoken, God has brought it to fulfillment. This birth that has happened, Isaac being born to uh, Abraham and Sarah, is um, it, it's impossibly miraculous. It's impossibly miraculous in the sense that Sarah has been barren her whole life and now she's past childbearing age, but still she has a son uh, and she has the son in the exact time frame that God said he would give her a son within a year's time. And here we are. The Lord visited her and, and give, gave, uh, gave them a son. So despite all the opposition that has been faced all the way up until now, despite the armies, the outside influences, the jeopardy that Abraham himself put the promise in, all of the things that have gone on that were obstacles of God fulfilling His promise, despite all of those things, God has been faithful to His Word. And God always is faithful to His Word. And in these first two verses, I think that's what, that's what Moses, the writer, is bringing out to us. God has done this according to what He said. God's done it just as He's promised, and God did it at the time of which God had spoken to Him. And then Abraham takes the child and he obeys the, the commands that God gave him. It says, oh, come on. There it is. I've got a little lag here. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. He was commanded to call him Isaac. You remember when that was? Around chapter 17, 17, verse 18, 19, right in there somewhere. God said, and you will call his name Isaac. What does the name Isaac mean? Anybody remember? Laughter. laughter. Isaac means laughter. And you're going to see the word laughter used over and over and over to, to uh, express the emotion that this family is feeling right now. Uh, both Abraham and Sarah laughed at different times uh, in doubt, doubting God's promise, doubt that it was possible. But Abraham obeys God and he, he names the boy Isaac, just as God had commanded him to do. And Abraham obeys the second command God gave to circumcise his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. Back in chapter 17 as well, God commanded that Abraham circumcise all of the males uh, in his household. And after eight days, Abraham circumcised Isaac as well uh, to, in, in obedience to uh, God's promise. If you look at verses 5 through 7, what you're going to see here is a family that is rejoicing in God's fulfillment. So it says, Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. Is using the, the picture of Isaac's name over and over again. She said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children at 90? Yet I've borne him a son in his old age. Talking about Abraham. So she says she's rejoicing in the fact that God has orchestrated all of this. He did so to glorify his name. This birth of Isaac testifies to, it testifies to God's faithfulness to his promise, as we have said over and over again. And that has been a theme in Genesis. If you've walked through from the very beginning, uh, at the fall of man, God made the promise that a seed would come and that seed would crush the head of the serpent. And we've watched that seed and the man mandate to be fruitful and multiply pass through each of these families until God chose Abraham, gave him the promise and now the seed the, the seed of promise is born to Abraham finally and Sarah rejoices in the fulfillment of these things. Instead of laughing in unbelief as she did before, she is laughing in joy. God has made laughter for me and she laughs in joy now that she has a son at night. I don't know how many of you 90-year-olds would be excited about having a kid at that age. But she is laughing. She has is, she is finally received the blessing that God has promised her. Uh, and she says that everyone is going to laugh when they, when they hear of what has happened. When they hear, they will laugh over me, meaning they will be joyful with me. They will rejoice in what has happened. 
And the reason is because of the promise that was given. Remember the promise that through Abraham all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Here we are in Mulvane 2021 and we're still talking about the promised seed, the promise that God made Abraham and Sarah and how that promise correlates with the promise we have of the true seed in Jesus Christ. Everyone is rejoicing in the, the, the seed promise that was given that of course finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ and she says everyone will laugh over me and then she just marvels over the fulfillment of it she says who would have thought who would have said to Abraham and Sarah that they would nurse children who would have believed it even able to nurse a child at 90 years old so this whole picture of verses 5 through 7 is just a picture of a family rejoicing a picture of a family just um reveling in the blessing of God, reveling in the promises fulfilled, reveling in what God has done. And then in verse 8, it says the child grew and was weaned. Uh, during this time, uh, we don't know for sure, but it was usually around three years old that a child was weaned uh, the way that they were doing it. So when it talks about being weaned, it's talking about... Um, uh, you know, three years old. It could have been two. It could have been four. We don't know for sure, but it was right in there somewhere. Usually, when when the child when the children were were weaned, and when the firstborn son was weaned, there was usually a feast. It was usually a, a, a celebration that the family has has brought forth an heir. And so Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was was weaned. They're celebrating the fact that the heir has come. The promise of God has been fulfilled. And there is, there is an heir from the very body of Abraham and Sarah. Not a servant that's going to take over his land and estates and his, his uh, inheritance, but one from his own body, just as God has promised. And so what you see here is just a bunch of rejoicing, a bunch of uh, happy family that is, is reveling in the promise of God, is laughing and joyful in the promise of God. Any questions, comments? Nope, pretty straightforward. I told you this chapter is pretty straightforward. So in verses 9 and 10, we see a threat that's recognized. Over and over again, there have been threats to the promise. We've seen threats from outside as armies came down and Abraham chases off after him. We've seen threats from inside as Abraham's own sin put the promise in jeopardy a couple of different times. And now we see this threat with it, which is in the family. And we're going to explain that as, as well. It says, But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, Ishmael, whom she had borne to Abraham laughing. She saw him laughing. So think about it. There's a joyful feast going on. Everybody's laughing. Everybody's rejoicing. And she sees this son, Ishmael, laughing. So she said to Abraham, Cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. So what do you think she saw when she saw Ishmael laughing? Y'all not going to answer me, are you? Oh, yeah, she was jealous. She was jealous. What's she jealous of? What she thinks is going to happen? Yeah, she thinks that Ishmael is going to be, uh, there's going to be a power struggle for the inheritance. She sees Ishmael is the firstborn son, and she sees a power struggle about to happen. But we don't know what was going on between Ishmael and Isaac. But the Apostle Paul references this, this event in Galatians, and he tells us that what was going on was not just laughing in the sense of joy, but laughing in the sense of mockery and persecution, as if, the, as if Isaac was picking on, it, uh, Ishmael was picking on Isaac. Let me read Galatians chapter 4, verse 28 through 30. He's comparing the son of the slave woman and the son of the free woman to Christians and to those who are uh, Jews by the flesh. He says, Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of the promise. But just as at that time he he was born according to the flesh. He who was born according to the flesh, Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. So also it is, it, is it, 
It is now. But what does the Scripture say? And we just read it. Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. He's using this episode to compare to how uh, the, the Jewish people were persecuting the Christians, and he compares them to the way that Isaac and Ishmael, uh, the way Ishmael was treating Isaac. And so all we know from the, the text in Genesis is that she saw him laughing. Paul takes that uh, and he says that he was persecuting him. He was making a mockery of him. So it wasn't a, a joyful laugh. It was a laugh of derision, maybe. It was a laugh of, of um, contempt. Uh, what what uh, Sarah's seeing is a threat recognized that there's going to be a power struggle. Now, Ishmael was born when Abraham was 86. We saw that in chapter 16, verse 16. Isaac is born when Abraham's how old? A hundred years old. Now, if Isaac took three years to wean, and that's just a supposition, if Isaac took three years to be weaned, that means Ishmael's about 15, 16 years old now. If we're talking about Isaac as a newborn, Ishmael's probably 11 or 12. Okay, so Ishmael is, is a young boy. So he's not, he's not like just a little toddler running around. He's an 11, 12-year-old boy or a 15 or 16-year-old teenager. And Sarah sees him laughing. Sarah sees him, what Paul says, is persecuting or mocking. Um, and, and so she sees him as a threat to the inheritance. The oldest son at this time in the ancient Near East inherited a double portion of the father's estate, inherited a double portion of the inheritance and the next son inherited a single portion. And so she saw that there very well could be a power struggle over the inheritance, which is really common. You're going to see it in Jacob's sons. There are a uh, power struggle over who, who gets what. You're going to see it, or you're going to see it in Isaac's sons as well. You're going to see it in Joseph's sons. You're going to see a power struggle over who gets the inheritance. And, and so in the, when, when Hagar had Ishmael, we talked about this then, um, the son, even the son of a slave woman, was entitled to an inheritance. And that's why Sarah gave Hagar to Ishmael in the first, uh, to Abraham in the first place. Because she wanted him to have a son. She wanted him to have an heir from his own body, which would take the inheritance and that would receive the promise and all of those things. So Sarah says she sees this power struggle that could possibly happen, this potential for Isaac to lose his inheritance or lose the bulk of his inheritance. And what she suggests is they all need to go. She suggests them being removed, wants them cast out. She wants no competition between the woman that she says cast out the slave woman with her son uh, because this slave, woman shall, this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. That was her, that was her big problem. Was she didn't want the heirs to be uh, in a power struggle. She didn't want the, uh, Ishmael to take uh, any of Isaac's inheritance. Now, is she righteous right here? Let me give you, before you answer, God is going to tell Abraham, do what she says. Cast him out. Is she righteous here? That, I, I don't know the answer to that question. And there's people that say yes, there's people that say no. So I just want to get, want to get us thinking about it. Yes, ma'am. It sounds like she's taking matters into her own hands. Yes, it sounds like she's taking matters into her own hands. No, it didn't work out well the first time. Technically, God gave the promise to who? Isaac. So whether she casts Ishmael out or not, who's the promise going to go to? If God is faithful to his promise, it's going to go to Isaac. Now, the other side to that is there are a lot of people that say this is how God intends to give the promise to Isaac by this, you know, casting them out. It, it's a very, it's a very um, difficult ethical question because we don't, we're, we're very separated from the culture that's going on here. Uh, but it doesn't seem like she's being very righteous. Doesn't seem like she's being very nice. Doesn't seem like she's definitely not trusting in the promise of God because she wants him out. That way there, this slave woman will not be heir with my son Isaac. So I tend to lean a little bit to the, the fact that she's not being righteous. Uh, she's not 
not being not being trusting of God's promise. But I do see the other side because the very next section, it says first that this grieved Abraham. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. He doesn't tell us which son, but it's got to be Ishmael. Because he, he, he'll say something else in a minute, but this thing was displeasing. Why was it displeasing to Abraham? He, he loved his son. Yeah, yeah. He loved his son. And we saw that. Remember when God said, you know, I'm going to give you a son from Sarah. And Abraham said, oh, that Ishmael would stand before you. He loved his son. He wanted it. He says, you don't even have to have a miraculous birth. I got a son right here with Hagar. You know, you can make him the blessing and everything. And Abraham is the head of the household. He is the he is the, the head of the clan. He will have to be the one that is going to cast them out. That's why Sarah comes to him and says, you need to cast him out. And this is very displeasing. It, it grieved Abraham. He's grieved about having to cast out his son, to send his son and Hagar, the slave on the way. Notice he's not very grieved about sending Hagar out. Does he? It doesn't say anything about her. He's just, he's, agree, he's grieved and displeased on the count of his, his son. But God affirms, God affirms what what Sarah is trying to do. It says, God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for though Isaac, through Isaac, shall your offspring be named. He says, do what she says because it's Isaac who is the promised seed. It's Isaac who will receive the inheritance. It's Isaac that will, through, your, through him, your seed will be named. Your name will continue through him. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also. Why? Because he is your offspring. So God says, listen to Sarah. God says, don't be grieved. He's not going to die. I'm going gr to make a great nation out of him, just like I promised, because he is your offspring. Um, the reason why God says to cast him out is because indeed Isaac is the seed, not Ishmael. Isaac is the one that God has placed his favor and promise upon. And evidently, you know, and evidently there was a threat. There could be a threat of, of bickering back and forth or a power struggle over the inheritance. But in the midst of this, God tells Abraham to go ahead and do what Sarah has suggested. Go ahead and cast them out uh, because he promises to give grace to Hagar and to give grace to Ishmael. And then he reminds him of the promise. Didn't I tell you that I was going to make a nation out of him? Remember when Hagar ran away? And God came to her, made the promise, I'm going to make him a nation. And she came back and, and told of that promise. And Abraham named him Ishmael uh, because that's what God told him to name. And so to, to ease his mind, God says he won't die. You send him out, he's not going to die. I'm going to make a great nation out of him. Any questions, comments? It's a lot of events going on right here and a lot of things that we're going to have to tie together at the end to show you how it all how it all works together. So he is uh, he's going to send him out because God promises that he will make a nation of him. And he is going to do so because even though Ishmael is not the son of promise, not the seed that was promised or not the covenant child of Abraham, he is an offspring of Abraham. And therefore, because he is an offspring of Abraham, God is going to bless him. God has promised to bless Abraham's offspring. And indeed, God is going to bless them. Now, I want you to look at this situation. So we see some kind of some kind of of thing go on where Sarah sees it, doesn't like it, tells Abraham, we're going to cast them out. Abraham doesn't really want to, but God says, OK, go ahead. You need to cast them out. Don't worry. I'm going to show grace to them. I'm going to make a nation of him. They're not going to die. You know, go ahead and do it now. In our thinking, when we see this, we we, we might be ten, we might have a tendency to say, that's just not fair, is it? I mean, it's not it's not Isaac. I mean, it's not a, uh, Ishmael's fault. 
It's not really even Hagar's fault. She's a slave girl. I mean, she's a slave woman. She, she didn't have a choice in any of this. So why does God cast them away? What we're going to see is he cast them out and Abraham cast them out and they just wander around in the wilderness until they're about to die. And God comes and saves them, of course. But, but what Abraham and Sarah decide to do is just boot them, just kick them right out. I don't care where you go, but you can't stay here. And they send her out in the same way that she ran away before, but she was you know, pregnant at the time. But here, she and her 12-year-old, 15-year-old, don't know how exactly old he was, they're, they're given some provisions and they just send them, send them on out. Is that, is that right? Is that fair? Is it fair for God to say, yes, this is what you need to do? I know it's a trick question because anything God does is right. Remember, God is addressing the mess that Abraham made through Hagar. He's addressing the sin that Abraham and Sarah did in jeopardizing the promise. But the promise still stands. And because Ishmael is the offspring of Abraham, however it happened, however sinfully it came about, however uh, with deceit and malice or wrongdoing or faithlessness caused this situation, the promise of God still stands that I will bless your offspring. And so God is... Is God is addressing this mess that Abraham and Sarah have made by not trusting the promise and offering Hagar to, to Abraham to try to get the try to get a, a seed, an offspring on their own. Uh, but God is also honoring this promise. He says, Yes, okay, we're gonna send them out because they are a threat to the inheritance. There will be a power struggle, there will be fighting in between them uh, for the for the inheritance. And so we are definitely gonna send him out, but the promise still stands. He is your offspring. It's the last line in verse 13. And therefore, I can't just let him go and let him go to his death. I can't just let him go because he is your offspring. And I promise that your offspring will have the blessing of the Lord. It's not the blessing of the covenant. It's not the blessing of the promised seed, but it is what we would probably call today common grace. He is giving him great. He's going to keep him alive, not only keep him alive, but make him a, a great nation. He's going to make him a great nation. So Abraham hears this, what God says, and Abraham sends them away. Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, Abraham obeys. He sends them away. The, the sentence structure here is a little strange, and it doesn't come across right in, in translation. Um, but And this is why you've probably seen, a lot of y'all probably know what flannel boards are, you know, and you put the, you, okay, you don't know what flannel boards are. So anyway, you put these pictures or the children's books that you have with the Bible stories, and Ishmael is always a baby. You know, Ishmael, Ishmael is always a baby, and poor Hagar is carrying her little baby out. But the way that the sentence is structured, um, the child is actually the second object of the word gave. So I, I know if, if that don't mean anything to you, what, what it means is he gave the bread, the provisions, the water, and the child to Hagar, and it was the provisions that were put on her shoulder, okay? I know it doesn't come across real good in English, but that's, that's kind of the sentence structure. So he gave, gave them to her and sent her off. So it's not a baby on her shoulder and provisions on her shoulder. The provisions are on her shoulder. He says, take your, your son, your child. Yell it is the, is the word. It can also be used for a young man or a, an adolescent, so it's not just an infant. Um, and so he sent them away. So she wanders in the wilderness of Beersheba. Beersheba is where Abraham is camped right now. And so this picture of her is just in the wilderness around Abraham's camp, wandering aimlessly. She doesn't have anywhere to go. She has nowhere to go and she's hopeless and helpless. She doesn't know what to do. And she has this skin of water. You know, we don't know how many gallons are in that skin of water, but it can't be too many, maybe one, two, three at the most. Uh, and so she's wandering in this, in this wilderness around the camp. She doesn't know where to go. It doesn't say she's making a beeline back to Egypt or anything. She's just wandering around, wandering around in the wilderness of the, uh, around Abraham's camp. 
And it says, she wandered until the water in the skin was gone, and she put the child under one of the bushes. She put the child under one of the bushes, and what she's doing there is she didn't want to watch him die. It says, Then she went and sat down opposite of him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, Let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and, and wept. So what we see here is the provisions have run out. There's no water anymore. Skin was gone. Presumably the food was gone. And she loses hope. She's out of provisions. They're probably near death. They're, they're starving to death. They are, what do you call it when you're thirsty to death? Parched, dehydrated, whatever. Yeah, okay. So that's going on. And she leaves her son in the bush to die. Now, it says, it, what she does is she actually lays him down. So it, it, some of your translations may say she threw him, you know, or chunked him or whatever like that. But basically it says she placed the child under one of the bushes. Uh, she placed him there. When this verb is used of people, almost always, not all the time, but almost always it refers to lowering a body into the grave. And so the picture that's being painted here in not so many words is that she is is leaving her son, she's placing her son in his grave. And she's doing so under a bush so he can die in the shade. You know? So this, this picture of this boy who is probably uh, parched or what do you call thirsty to death again? Dehydrated, whatever. I like thirsty to death. He was thirsting to death. <laughs> she's laying him in his grave, basically. So don't think of it as a little swaddled baby laying in, in, in a bush crying and everything. This is, this, is, this is a boy. This is a teenager that is, you know, he's, he's what is what's the word again? Dehydrated. He's dehydrated. And it's, it's like she lays him down in a place where it's, son, this is, this is where you're going to die. You know, she has uh, the good grace to find a, a shade for him to die in the shade. And then she goes off a bow shot away, which is a, a pretty good way. It's still in still where you can, you know, you can kind of know where they are. But, you know, you could shoot a bow. I mean, a, a bow will go a long way, probably back to the gym back there. So, you know, uh, it, it's a pretty good ways away. And she's crying. She's weeping. Um, and. She doesn't want to see him die. You know, this is a picture of an utterly hopeless woman about to die. And she does not want to face the fact that her son is going to die. And she certainly doesn't want to watch him die. So what you see here is God is going to come and he's going to, he's going to remind her of the promise. Remember the last time Hagar was in the wilderness? What happened? Yeah, God came to her. And made her a promise. Your son's going to be a great nation. I wonder what she's thinking right here. Left him in his grave. I don't want to watch him die. What's she thinking? Yeah, it's over with. You know, there is no whatever promise was had because Abraham booted us, uh, us out. God has must have left us. Is that true? If God makes a promise, God keeps his word. That's who he is. And he can do nothing other than that, if he makes a promise, he will keep his word. So she's weeping. But look what it says. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God came to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? He didn't say he heard Hagar's voice, Hagar's weeping. He heard the voice of the boy. Why does he say that? What does Ishmael's name mean? God hears. God hears. Who was the promise for? Ishmael. For Ishmael. I'll make Ishmael. So what you see here is another instance of God. God is gracious and God is kind and merciful. And he's coming to show mercy, coming to show kindness. But because he, the last thing we saw in verse 17 was it was Hagar that was weeping. But God came because he heard the voice of the boy whom he made a promise to. That he promised would be. And he hears the crying of the boy and he comes and he tells Hagar. He says, what troubles you? He says, don't be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. 
He says, up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. The angel assures Hagar that the promise that he made concerning Ishmael way back before he was born, 15, 16 years earlier, or 12 years earlier, we don't know how exactly how old Ishmael is at this point, all those years earlier, God met her in the wilderness and made a promise. And God remembers his promise, even if Hagar has forgotten the promise. And it's almost like when he says, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, meaning grab hold of him with your hand. He says, for I will make him a great nation. It's almost like he's saying, don't you remember what I told you? You know, don't you remember the promise that I made? He made it back in chapter 16, verses 10 and 12. Don't you remember? Why are you troubled? What troubles you? Go get your boy. Don't you remember the promise that I made to you? And then in verse 19, it says, God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. Now it says God opened her eyes so that she could see this well of water. My question to you, and this is one that I also don't have an answer for, but there's debate on either side. Was the well always there? Or did God manifest the well out of nothing? What do you think? Based on the way it reads, look at how it reads in verse 19. It was there. I think it was there. Because he doesn't say God manifested the way. He says God opened her eyes. God, so her eyes were blinded to this well. And, and I don't know that it would be like a supernatural blindness that has come over her. I think, and this is just me thinking, this is not scripture and I can't prove this, but this is just me thinking out loud. I think she was so distraught, so downcast, she couldn't see the salvation that was right in front of her. And God comes and reminds her of the promise and he opens her eyes and she sees this well of water. She didn't see her deliverance was right there in front of her. And so she goes to this well and she gets water and she gives the boy a drink so he's, he won't die of thirst. And it says, and God was with the boy and he grew up. Why didn't it say that God was with Hagar and the boy grew up? Because Ishmael was the one God made the promise to. He made the promise to Hagar, but it was about Ishmael. And it says God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness, became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. And that's pretty much the whole history we get of Ishmael. So he grows, he marries, the promise is fulfilled. He, of course, we know the Ishmaelites, you know, they became a great nation, just like he said. But what we've seen here is that God has protected his promise from every angle. From every angle, he's protected his promise. He protected his promise to Abraham by giving him a son. He protected the promise that he made about Isaac, who would be the heir. He protect by removing the threat of the one who would struggle for his inheritance. He protected his promise for Ishmael and Hagar by, by keeping them alive in the wilderness and making a nation out of them, just like he said he was going to do. God has kept his promise in every way, in every shape, in every form in every direction from every enemy, whether it be outside, whether it be Abraham's own heart that is railing against it, trying to, you know, trying to jeopardize the promise, whether it be Abraham's sin in taking Hagar and having this child, uh, trying to, uh, to get the promise himself without trusting God, no matter what obstacle has been thrown by human sinfulness or by circumstances or by all of these things, God protects his word. Man, that gives us such a, I don't know, it, it, for me, it's just such a peace that, you know, even when life seems like it's spinning out of control, when there's enemies attacking from outside, enemies from inside, when the whole world looks like it's against you and everything is going wrong, you, you can rest in the fact that God is going to protect his promise. There's absolutely nothing in heaven above, hell beneath, or in all of creation that can keep God's word from being 100% true, from keep God, to keep God from fulfilling his promise. And the promise that we
we have is eternal life in Jesus Christ, and that nothing can separate us from that. Man, that is, that's, that's comforting. It's very comforting. Questions, comments, cries of outrage? Yes, that was probably where Hagar's family was. Because Hagar is an Egyptian slave, and she just shows up out of nowhere after Pharaoh almost took um, Rebekah. Is it Rebekah? Abraham and Re not Rebekah. Sarah. Sarah. I always get Sarah, Rebekah, Isaac, and I always get them mixed up. So yeah, so it's a pretty good indication that Hagar was one of those. It said Pharaoh gave him male servants and female servants. Hagar was one of those. And so she, you know, Abraham's family has booted her out. So she goes in, I mean, what I think is she goes back to her homeland to find a wife for, for her son. So inside threat has been removed, yet God's promise is still intact. And then you have this section that is just... I mean, it's, it's, it's really neat. So the scene changes. We've dealt with Ishmael. We've seen what happened to Ishmael. He's okay. Great nation made out of him. Got a wife from Egypt, you know, and he's going to do his thing. We'll see the Ishmaelites later on. It says, at that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. This is the same Abimelech as we saw in the last chapter. Why would he think that God is with you in all that you do? Oh, come on, that's an easy question. Yeah, because even dumb Abraham, after he did what he did, God came to Abimelech in the dream and said, I'm going to kill you if you don't fix this. And so, yeah, you better believe God's with him in all that you do. And he says, so now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity. But as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal kindly with me and with the land where you have sojourned. Why does Abimelech want to make a covenant with Abraham? Huh? Yes, so he doesn't die. He said, because God's with you in all that you do. And if God's with you, I want to be with you. But instead of just saying, hey, let's be buds, he says, I need you to swear to me by God that you're not going to deal fall. Does he have any reason not to trust Abraham? Yeah, like a really big reason not to trust Abraham. Yeah, Abraham was the cause of almost his demise through his deceit and his lying. And though he's a prophet of God, we saw that last time that, that God, God's covenant is upon him. And so Abimelech seeks an alliance with him. Uh, Abimelech seeks to, to make this alliance because God is with you and God is fighting for you and God's promise dwells upon you and there's nothing anybody can do about that. I want to make a covenant with you that you're not going to deal falsely with me or my descendants or with my posterity, but you're going to deal kindly with me in the same way that I've dealt kindly with you and with the land, with all of the nation where you are so where you're sojourning, where you're where you're living right now. And so he's covering his bases. He doesn't trust Abraham just to, uh, just to you know, be a good guy and not do anything wrong. He wants a covenant with Abraham because Abraham, there can be no doubt, even though he's not a perfect man, even though he is a sinner, he is blessed of God in every area. If you just think about his history, this same man took 318 people and ran and, and defeated five armies, four regional armies. Uh, this, is, this is a man that has been supremely blessed by God. Even so that the God of the universe came to Abimelech and wouldn't let his marriage be defiled. Yeah, God is with him and he wants to make an alliance with him. And so he asked for a covenant and Abraham swears to the covenant. He says, Abraham said, I will swear. But there's one thing we need to talk about, Abimelech. Some of your guys stole a well from me that I dug. 
When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me. I'm just hearing about it now, and I have not heard of it until today. So he says, well, there's one thing we need to talk about, Abimelech. Some of your guys took one of my wells, and Abimelech says, I, I have no idea about this, but, you know, we're going to make it right, w whatever. And so he swears, Abraham swears, he tells him about this stolen well, and uh, he, um, what were we, verse 25, it, Abraham tells him about this stolen well, and he still has a promise in the land, but Abimelech doesn't know who, who did this. And so what they do is he says, I don't know who did this, but Abraham says, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. So in the last chapter, Abimelech gave Abraham a bunch of sheep and oxen and everything. And now Abraham is giving sheep and oxen back to Abimelech and they made a covenant. Abraham sent seven ewe lambs uh, of the flock apart to set them apart from what he was giving Abimelech. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you set apart? And he said, these seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. He's basically saying, I'm taking my well back. And here are these seven ewe lambs as a witness that you are giving me my well back. Uh, these you're going to take from my hand and this is the witness that I dug this well. This is my well and we're, I'm going to have this well back. And so Abimelech says, therefore, or then it says, therefore the place was called Beersheba. Beersheba means well oath because they made an oath there about you know, about the well, you know. And so he says he calls it Beersheba because both of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. So what you've just seen here is a covenant that has been struck between the king of the Philistines and Abraham, that they were going to do well to each other. They were going to, they were going to uh, be kind to each other, deal justly with each other. Uh, in the last chapter we saw, Abimelech had already told Abraham, you can settle wherever you want to in my land and everything's going to be fine. They returned to their home and it says Abraham, Abraham returned to his. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree, and there's several thoughts as to why a tamarisk tree, and we won't get into that, but he planted this tree in Beersheba. This is where he was staying, and he called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. He, he worships God in this place, and Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. So he returns in peace. He's worshiping God. Now, at the end of this chapter, this is the last verse of the chapter, what you've seen here, it, it, it's, like, it's like a sitcom on TV. It's all wrapped up in a neat little bow and everything is just fine. Everything is wonderful now. There's nothing more Abraham can ask for. All the promises are fulfilled. The seed has come. The, the son that God has promised for 25 years is finally here. The threat from inside the family has been removed now and it's gone. Isaac will have the double portion of the inheritance. Now the land is providing for them. They have the well. They have their run of the land in Philistine country. He said, Abimelech said, you can stay wherever you want to stay. And they have this, this water supply that's now uh, giving them water. He's got a covenant with the people of the land that they will do good to him and he will do good to them. So every aspect of the blessing of God that was promised to Abraham now is a reality. And so you'd think, finally, Abraham can just rest in the blessings. After, after 25 years of struggling and fighting from threats from the outside and from his own sin from the inside and obstacles to the promise and, and things not working out the way that he wanted them to or the timetable not working out because God waited all this time. Finally, here he is and all the promises have come to fruition. He's got the son. He's got a covenant with the people of the land. He's got the anywhere he wants in the land. And he's got this, this provision of water and, and, and prosperity in the land. It's almost like you could have verse 35 say, and they lived happily ever after. I didn't put this on the screen, but if you're looking at your Bible, the very next section 
Abraham is enjoying the blessings. Thank you, God. You have been so good to me. You have done everything that you said you were going to do. And God says, by the way, you know that son that I gave you, your only son? I want you to take him to the top of Mount Moriah and I want you to kill him. The school of faith is not over with yet. He's going to learn what true faith is, even in the midst of his comfort and his blessing. So this chapter was really, I told somebody today, you know, if you don't come tonight, just watch online or watch later. You probably, all God's word is wonderful. It's good for instruction, reproof. And, and, but this chapter is almost like a bridge because what it does is it shows just everything we've been waiting for is done. It's fulfilled. The sun is here. The thread is gone. There's peace in the land. The land's providing for him. Everything is just perfect. And it's a bridge to the next section where everything is perfect. Why would you want me to go and kill the son that I've been waiting 25 years for? When you finally give me the promise and now you're telling me, notice he didn't just say the promise wasn't just you will have a son and you, I will make, you know, your great nation through that son. No, he said you will have a son. You will name him Isaac. It will be from Sarah and he will be the seed. He will be the great nation. And now after he's finally here, this is him. God says, okay, if you trust me, Take your son, the one that I promised you would be a great nation, and you go and kill him. And we're going to see Abraham learn a great lesson in faith in the next section. Questions, comments? <laughs> no? All right, one of these days we're going to stop and we're going to have to go... We're going, to have, we're going to back up and we're going to trace the story because once we get into Abraham and especially when we get into J Joseph and all the things that happen, it's easy for us to lose sight of the big story. You see what I mean? So we, we started with the big story, the promise of the seed and how that, that moved from, from, uh, from uh, Noah to, to Abraham and to, we're, we're going to watch it move from Abraham to Isaac and then we're going to watch it move from Isaac to Jacob and when you get into Jacob and his 12 sons and Joseph being sent to Egypt and all, it, it's easy to get lost in the trees and forget the big story. So one of these times we're going to, we're going to back up, probably not next week because we need to get chapter 22 in because it goes with chapter 21, but one of these days we're going to back up and we're going to trace the story up until this point and, and make sure we, we see the forest as well. Okay? All right, let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you today for your word. Thank you for Genesis, God. Thank you for um, the story of beginnings, God, the story of your promise, the story of the seed that will come, and thank you for the fulfillment that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you that tonight we have learned uh, through the trials of Abraham, through the things that he has endured, both that he caused himself and that was placed upon him, that your promise endures. God, even for the one who is outside of your covenant because you made a promise. Your promise was kept in his life as well. God, we, we take great comfort in that for we have a multitude of beautiful and wonderful promises in Jesus Christ that we've been given. And God, we can hold fast to them no matter what happens in this world because of who you are, that you are a faithful God who keeps his word to a thousand generations, Lord. And we thank you for that. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.